Very good morning, all of you. I am Dr. M. C. Nataraja. Welcome all of you for the second session of the topic. So today, I will be introducing to the design of steel structure. So today, I am planning to discuss uh, the typical designations that we are using to identify the different uh, cross sections of steel and also we will be discussing uh, the composition of the steel in general. Set of characters are being used to identify the yield strength of the steel. The yield strength of the steel is designated as Fy. Ultimate strength is generally designated as Fu. The grade of steel as Fy300 means the yield strength of the steel is 300 mega pascal 300 newton per mm square in case the steel is having both upper and lower yield point the value 300 corresponds to the lower yield point so like this so we have fy 250 fy 300 fy 400 like that different grades of steel is being used in the fabrication of steel structures more information about uh, the different grades of steel, you can get it from IS 800 2007 and from that uh, even the other properties of steel can also be identified. So we should know some of the physical properties of structural steel, so which is valid irrespective of the grade of steel. You all know that the unit mass of steel rho is 7850 kg per meter cube. Generally, it is taken as 7800 to 7850 kg per meter cube. And you know the unit mass of uh, concrete is 2400 kg per meter cube. This unit mass is also sometimes referred to as the density of uh, concrete or density of steel. So, the density of steel is uh, 7.85 times compared to the density of water where the density of water as you know is 1000 kg per meter cube so compared to concrete where it is 2400 kg the steel is uh, approximately three times uh, heavier compared to concrete the modulus of elasticity e is equal to 2 into 10 to the power of 5 newton per mm square it's also called as mega pascal or 210 Giga Pascal. The Poisson's ratio of the material is uh, 0.3 and of course it varies depending on the grade of steel 0.25 going up to 0.3 and generally for all calculation it is taken as 0.3. So another important uh, uh, modulus is the modulus of uh, rigidity this is also sometimes referred to as the shear modulus it is 0.769 into 10 to the power of 5 mega pascal if you compare this g with e approximately e is three times more compared to g or the shear modulus is approximately one third of that of e the coefficient of thermal expansion is another important property alpha that is 12 into 10 to the power of minus 6 per degree centigrade what this alpha represents the alpha represent the strain. What steel undergo as a strain per degree change in temperature is what is reflected here. Suppose if you have a steel at a temperature of 20 degree centigrade where the length of steel is say L, then if the temperature rises from 20 degree to 40 degree centigrade where there is a rise of 20 degree centigrade what is the total strain induced in the material? The total strain induced in the material is coefficient of thermal expansion alpha multiplied by increasing temperature that is from 20 to 40 means 20 degree increase in temperature. So knowing that uh, total strain of the material for that 20 degree centigrade and if you know the initial length of the sample as L, the total strain can be determined and as you know total strain is change in length 
divided by the original length. So change in length which is the deformation. In this particular case the expansion what the steel having a length L undergoes due to 20 degree centigrade can be determined. So in this connection the coefficient of thermal action expansion plays a very important role. Now here I have uh, given in the form of a table the different uh, steel designations that are generally being uh, used and what are the composition of these different grades. As I mentioned steel is nothing but uh, iron but we have the added alloy elements. The carbon is uh, one of the common element uh, that is to be added in addition to combinations of the other alloy elements. Now if you see this uh, OES250 where the yield strength is 250, the carbon content is uh, approximately 0.12% but of course uh, it is having the other three elements manganese with 0.5% phosphorus with 0.04% and sulfur with 0.035%. So this particular steel has certain set of mechanical properties which is a function of the carbon content and of course it is a function of uh, other alloy elements being added. Now if you take uh, the yield stress 300 or 350 because we need the increased stress 300 to 350 compared to 250 that increase in strength is mainly due to the addition of carbon content. In 250 the carbon content is 0.12. Now the increased strength in this case is because of increasing the percentage of carbon. So increase in percentage of carbon as I mentioned so it is really to increase the tensile strength of the steel. In addition to that if you see the other alloy elements so depending on the requirement the percentage can be increased or decreased. But in this particular case the manganese is slightly increased up to 1.6. So whether to increase or decrease uh, the percentage of uh, the alloy elements uh, mainly depends on what mechanical properties we need to improve. So in case of FY450 going up to FY550 the carbon content is uh, somewhat reduced but of course this carbon content of 0.2% is more than the carbon content that is being used in grade 250. But the addition of manganese to the extent of 1.2 and the combinations of phosphorus and sulfur also in a way add to increase in mechanical strength of steel. So the increase in strength due to carbon content is quite substantial but however a controlled addition of combinations of the other alloy elements also increases the tensile strength to a certain extent. So from this particular table it is clear that if you want the increased uh, strength in steel we need to increase the carbon content and of course the addition of uh, combinations of the other elements uh, will suitably modify the mechanical properties of the steel and sometimes uh, there is a slight increase in the tensile strength of the material also. So that is what is being seen from this particular table. Now when you take a sample of steel to the laboratory and test it in a uniaxial uh, tension situation, so we will find uh, the following properties. Now kindly see the designation of steel FY250 going up to uh, FY550, FY or even FS depending on the situation. It is 250 at an increment of 50 megapascal is what is being reflected in the first column of the table. And whatever you have here as a numerical with the grade is the representation of the yield strength of the material. So that is where the minimum yield strength is being represented. When you go on test it, so you should get a minimum yield strength of 250 and slightly above that. So that is where the tensile strength of the material comes into picture. So this is uh, what the tensile strength minimum that is being uh, expected. So this is what the ultimate tensile strength of the material. So this is what we have seen in this stress strain diagram. So this is the yield strength corresponding to the lower yield point and this is what the ultimate tensile strength of the material referred to as just the tensile strength. What is expected is a minimum of 250 as far as yield strength is concerned and 320 as far as 
ultimate insight strength is concerned. But when you actually test the steel, uh, we get slightly more strength. So that is always be expected. But anything less than that, uh, the steel is not manufactured properly and we need to reject that particular type of steel. And also if you see the minimum percentage elongation, this, this has been uh, discussed in the previous class. The percentage of elongation is the change in length over the gauge length divided by the initial gauge length as a percentage. So this will generally vary from about 20% going up to 40%. This is what we have seen in the previous class. But as far as uh, this particular grade F S250 is concerned, when the strain is measured or the deformation is measured, it is not the strain, the percentage of elongation as a deformation measured over the gauge length of 50 mm should not be less than 25 mm. And if the gauge length is increased to say 80 mm, then the elongation decreases marginally and even in that case it should not be more than 22%. So many of these uh, details are made available in the course of practices. So we have several Indian course of practices catering to different types of steel and all these uh, requirements will be specified in those codes. We also have international uh, codes of practices. The practices as per <coughs> American specifications are concerned or it could be British uh, standard or it could be the Norwe Norwegian standard or any other country's standard. So it is better to know the values being specified in those international codes of practices, especially when you take some project, we need to compare our results, not only with respect to the information available in the Indian codes of practices, and many a times we need to compare the results with international codes of practices also. So in that connection, the national international codes of practices plays a very important role. Now here in this particular table, I have given the general properties of steel for the four different types of steel I discussed in the previous class. So we have seen the first category of carbon steel, alloy steel, stainless steel and tool steel. So generally for the construction purpose the carbon steel is uh, recommended and uh, in some of the special situations you can also use the stainless steel. So stainless steel is generally being used these days uh, for the construction of staircases. Now if you see the first four properties, the density, elastic modulus, poison ratio and thermal expansion. So these four properties remains more or less constant. It is not going to change. Even if it is going to change, it is over a very small range. So that change can be rather neglected. So irrespective of the type of steel, so these four properties will have more or less the same value. So that is what is being reflected in this particular table. So there are uh, many other uh, mechanical properties of steel. As you can see here, the thermal conductivity as express, expressed by this particular formula, the specific heat, electrical resistivity, tensile strength. In fact, which you have seen in the previous slide also, it varies as a function of the composition, yield strength, percentage elongation and hardness. So these are all uh, the other mechanical properties of the steel. But if you see in this table, these properties do vary over a range. It is not constant. So that is where uh, depending on a particular type of steel and also depending on what percentage of alloy contents, carbon and other combinations of the alloy content, the mechanical properties vary and accordingly the information needed to be generated. All these things can be done by conducting suitable experiments in the laboratory. So let us see the different uh, structural steel forms uh, uh, that can be used in the construction of steel. Now as far as the general classification of the structural steel forms are concerned, so basically we have uh, three forms as you can see here. One is uh, the crude product, semi-finished products rolled finished products and end products. So what is important uh, in the design of steel structure and as far as the properties of the sections are concerned, it is the rolled finished products and the end products. And how these uh, rolled products and end products are manufactured? 
So before that, uh, you should have some information as to what these crude products are. Now, crude products are available in the following uh, two forms. Products which are either in the liquid state, that is at the time of manufacturing of the steel. So the steel is basically in the liquid state and uh, that gets transformed into a solid state. So depending on uh, the form into which uh, the liquid goes. The form what you are going to get from the liquid state uh, into the solid state is referred to as the ingots. Liquid state is nothing but uh, it is the state ready for pouring and obtained directly from the melting of raw materials. So this is what the manufactured steel in the molten condition where the temperature of the steel is uh, uh, close to 1300 degree to 1600 degree uh, and things like that. When this liquid steel is uh, poured into certain molds, molds of specific shape and you are going to get the hardened steel of that particular shape and that is generally referred to as the ingot. And also you must have seen uh, in uh, uh, the manufacturing of reinforcing bar in design of RCC structure, basically the different diameters of the steel rods, 10 mm, 12 mm, 16 mm, what you mentioned in the design. So those shapes of rods are basically manufactured from ingots. So the manufacturer will purchase the ingot, the ingots will be processed further so that depending on the type of the manufacturing technique, uh, so we are going to get the steel rod which is used as a reinforcing bar. In the same way the ingots can be used to manufacture different forms of uh, structural steel which can be angle sections, T sections, channel sections, I sections and so on and so forth. Now as far as the semi finished products are concerned, so these are generally the products obtained uh, either by rolling or by forging of ingots or by continuous casting and generally intended for conversion into finished products either by rolling operation or by forging operation. So semi finished products will not be having a proper shape. So a lot of variation do comes into picture over the length of the member and that is the reason many a times these semi finished products are not recommended for the construction of steel. Finally, we have the rolled finished products and uh, they are also sometimes referred to as the end product and these are the products which have been manufactured generally by the rolling operation and which are normally not further hard worked in the steel works. So it is directly purchased and it is used in the construction and that is what uh, the rolled sections uh, we are interested in the design of steel structures. What these uh, different uh, types of rolled steel sections? As I mentioned, so we have different uh, forms of uh, rolled steel sections that are available and that can be used in the fabrication. So they are the I sections generally used for beams and columns. Generally it is referred to as the beam section in the form of an I. Channel section in the form of C. We have angle section which is available in the form of L, T section looks like T, plates, flats, strips and we also have structural steel tubes of different uh, thicknesses and different shapes. We have the rods of different uh, diameter and of course weights of different diameters. So these are all the different types of rolled steel sections generally used uh, in the construction of steel. So you can see so some of the sections which I have taken from the Google. So these are all the different types of beam sections. They are the I sections and these are the angle sections. These are uh, the rounded cross sections. So solid tubes and this is a flat section and this is the channel section. And how all these sections are represented in the design and how it is designated from the point of identification. The information regarding the properties of all these sections is available in the steel table. So in the last class also I made a mention of uh, steel table by Agor. If you go through that steel table for all these different types of sections the various properties are being mentioned in the form of a table. So depending on the type of the design so those 
parameters can be taken directly and you can go ahead with the analysis and design. Now, as far as the eye sections are concerned, it looks like this. Again, this is the photograph of the actual eye section and this is what the types of eye sections you see in the open market from the manufacturer and there are two different types of eye sections you can see here. So these eye sections can be used as a beam element and sometimes as a column element depending on the situation. So in the construction of a portal frame, not only for the vertical column element and also for the horizontal beam element, so different types of eye sections can be used. If you see the first set of sections, you can make out that the horizontal element being referred to as the flange and you can also see the vertical element in between the two horizontal elements that is in between the flanges, so we have the web. And we have the projecting element of the eye section that is referred to as the outstand of the eye sections which you will be able to see in a schematic diagram which I will be showing shortly. What is important in this particular section is uh, how this uh, flange looks like. And if you see the top layer of the flange and the bottom layer of the flange, they are parallel. So that is the reason these types of cross sections are referred to as parallel flange sections where the top face and the bottom face of the eye section are parallel. But if you see on the other hand, uh, the photo shown in the right side, so this is the eye section referred to as the non-parallel flange sections. So obviously the top surface is uh, horizontal, so that should be horizontal so that uh, the fabrication and connection is going to be easy. But if you see the bottom section, it is tapering. So if you see the edge, the end of the eye section, this is being referred to as the toe. So there is a small curvature connected with uh, the toe. And we have uh, a gradual increase in the thickness of the flange as you can see here. And later we have some sort of a transitional change in the thickness in the form of a fillet. So obviously we have two things to be looked at. So one is uh, the curvature corresponding to the toe, how exactly it is changing. And what is the curvature? the radius of the curvature, how it is changing corresponding to the junction of the flange and the width. So these are all uh, again important uh, parameters that governs some of the properties of the cross section which are needed in the analysis of I section as a beam or as a column. The thickness of the flange is taken somewhere at the center of the outstand because it is varying from outside up to the junction but what is the outstand that need to be calculated and exactly at off the outstand if you calculate the thickness so that is what is designated as the average flange thickness of the tapered eye section. And another interesting thing what you need to see either in the parallel flange section or in the non-parallel flange section which is the uh, tapered flange section. So the thickness of the flange, the thickness of the flange is obviously more compared to the thickness of the web. And uh, the, there are uh, many instances where the depth of the web is substantially more compared to the width of the flange. So that is uh, generally being followed uh, in the beam section. As the depth of the beam is made larger, the whole depth of the beam becomes larger compared to the width. And as a result of that, the second moment of area about the centroidal axis, which is referred to as uh, the moment of inertia that increases substantially. So in fact, the moment of inertia about horizontal axis plays a very important role when this eye section is used as a beam, that too when it is subjected to uniaxial bending. And sometimes uh, the member is also subjected to biaxial bending, but in that case, the moment of inertia about the y-axis also plays a very important role. But in this case, the moment of inertia about y y axis is substantially less compared to the value about the horizontal axis. The horizontal axis is referred to as the major principal axis which is uh, the symmetric axis and uh, another axis uh, is referred to as the minor principal axis. So both these axes are the symmetric axis but the major symmetric axis uh, 
is the axis about which the second moment of inertia is absolute maximum compared to the absolute minimum value about y y axis which is the orthogonal axis compared to the first horizontal axis so many of these uh, properties you can get it from the steel table now you can also see another photo where uh, the different sizes of the eye section as you can see in a open market how these uh, eye beam and eye column sections can be designated so this eye section can be used either as a beam or as a column as i mentioned but we have the following uh, five general classification indian standard junior beam isjb the second one is indian standard lightweight beam islb indian standard medium weight beam ismb indian standard heavy weight beam ishb indian standard wide flange beam iswb we should know as to what these uh, different uh, designations of the beam is all about in what way the properties of the section do vary what is important is uh, how the moment of inertia about ixx axis is varying compared to iyy axis so depending on the magnitude of the moment depending on what amount of section modulus is required to assist the moment we need to identify a suitable section so for this uh, the properties of these i sections plays a very important role but if you see the first one isjb as the name indicates it is a junior beam so this section can be used as a flexural member the flexural member carrying a light to moderate load where heavy resistance is not required so that is where small depth something like isjb 75 isjb 100 so we will be able to select from steel table as per the indian standard lightweight beam is concerned compared to medium beam for a particular length say 1 meter the weight of the lightweight beam is slightly less compared to that of medium beam the quantity of material available in a cross section is slightly less in islb compared to isfb the thickness of the web the thickness of the flange is slightly less compared to the corresponding thicknesses of web bond flange of ismb so as a result of that in islb there is a greater chance the cross section may undergo local buckling because of reduced thickness compared to the thickness in ismb the first three isjb islb ismb can be used for flexural members flexural members of different span where the rigidity required to resist the moment is varying over a range the fourth one is uh, indian standard heavy beam as far as heavy beam is concerned so we have a comparable moment of inertia with respect to horizontal axis and also with respect to vertical axis so generally these isfb sections are preferred for columns where the resistance with respect to both the orthogonal direction plays an important role generally ishb is not recommended for b because it becomes an economical so indian standard wide flange beam any times is uh, being used as a beam and sometimes it can be used as a column also but depending on how it behaves uh, we have to take those criteria in the analysis and design to see that the final design is safe now as far as the resistance of the structural parameters are concerned because we need to apply axial load where your member is behaving like a tension member or a compression member and sometimes the member is uh, behaving uh, as a beam where it is a flexural member where both bend moment and shear force comes into picture and depending on the situation so the element is also subjected to some amount of torsion what property of the cross section plays an important role is a question so many of these things we must have studied and appreciated in strength of materials and also in structural analysis as far as the resistance of the cross section with respect to axial load is concerned we need to look for axial rigidity the axial rigidity is represented as ae we'll give 
is the property of the material modulus of elasticity the Young's modulus where the cross sectional area plays a role in resisting the axial load. If more axial load is to be resisted we need to have more area either the tensile load or the compressive load depending on the situation. In case of tension it is purely the area that matters whereas in case of compression it is not only the cross sectional area and it also depends on what is the slenderness of the element. We will be seeing all these things uh, when we take up uh, the analysis and design of tension member and also compression member. What is important uh, in axial load carrying capacity is the axial rigidity which is directly proportional to A, the cross sectional area of the section. When you select the section for moment, the bending moment, the factor to be considered is EI, the rigidity modulus. E is the Young's modulus, I is the moment of inertia. So this uh, modulus with respect to the moment plays a very important role. So this is referred to as uh, the modulus with respect to moment. The second one is uh, the modulus with respect to torsion, torsional rigidity many a times we call it as GJ where G is the shear modulus, J is the polar moment of inertia of the cross section. In case of I section, the J polar moment of inertia along the longitudinal axis is nothing but the summation of the moments of inertia with respect to the two rectangular axis of the cross section. IZ plus IY, the second moment of area, the moment of inertia with respect to ZZ plus the moment of inertia with respect to YY is equal to moment of inertia along the longitudinal axis, polar moment of inertia. So many of uh, these type of sections uh, will be using in factories either as a column or as a beam or even as uh, the horizontal elements and elements of different nature. And in the construction of construction of industrial buildings and multi-story buildings also we will be using these types of I sections, I sections of different sizes. Many of the other properties as I mentioned you will be getting it from steel table. And whatever uh, I told uh, with respect to these sections is uh, what I have mentioned here. That is where many advantages of I sections comes into picture. Though I beams are excellent for unidirectional bending in a plane parallel to the web, they do not perform well in bidirectional bending. As far as the biaxial bending is concerned, the performance is not that good because with respect to the vertical axis being referred to as the YY axis, the moment of resistance is substantially less. But if you take the ratio of uh, IZ by IY, it's not just by an order of magnitude. It varies uh, uh, from something like 50 to 100 and in some, time, so in some cases it is even more than 100. It means uh, the resistance of the I section above the horizontal axis uh, is 50 to 100 times more compared to the resistance what we have in the vertical direction. And in such situations where we need a substantial resistance with respect to both the axes and we need to build the section where two or three I sections with different combinations uh, is connected either by bolting or by welding and such type of a uh, compound sections are used whenever biaxial loading situation comes into picture. These beams uh, also shows little resistance to twisting. It is quite obvious, as I mentioned, twisting is a function of J, where J is a function of uh, IZ plus IY. IZ is rather more, but IY is less. As I mentioned, if you take one example where uh, IXX means IZZ is 200 times compared to IY, and if you add IZZ plus IYY, it will become 201 compared to 200. A very small increase in uh, J comes into picture. In fact, uh, the entire twisting in such section is being controlled by IZ. IY is really not contributing. So, that is the reason in case of I sections used for resisting 
twisting the performance is really not that good and if you apply more twist onto such sections the cross section will undergo warping and that is where change in shape comes into picture out of bending of the cross section comes into picture for torsion dominated problems as i mentioned we need to go for a section which is good not only in the horizontal axis even with respect to the vertical axis where iz is equal to iy in such situation box sections comes into picture either the circular cross section or the square section plays a very important role and those sections are really strong and stiff and performs better in case of biaxial bending and also in case of torsion loading so these are all some of the specific advantages of i sections now here i have uh, presented uh, one cross section for i section so this is uh, what the section i have uh, copied from the is code kindly see the different uh, dimensions and the notations being used so here the width is uh, represented as uh, b width of the flange or the width of the cross section kindly see the overall depth of the cross section it is referred to as d but in some cases it is referred to as h so you have to be very careful in distinguishing uh, these notations is code is 800 uses some set of notations otherwise the steel table uses entirely a different set of notations so what is important is to appreciate the meaning of these notations rather than uh, what exactly the designation now kindly see this is what the diagram i have taken from the is code so the width is uh, represented as small b the depth is represented as h it is the overall depth from the top of the flange top flange to the bottom of the bottom flange that is h and also you can see the thickness of the web is designated as tw and the thickness of flange at the center of the outstand that is tf and also i told you about uh, the two fillets the root of the fillet the root of the fillet at the toe and root of the fillet at the junction of the flange and the web so it will be having certain radius so that is what is referred to as the root of the radius the radius of the root at the fillet this is the radius the radius of the root at the toe so that is what the radius of this curved portion as far as this toe is concerned similarly the radius of the fillet at the junction is another factor to be looked at and also as i told you the thickness is measured at this particular uh, section so which is uh, the width of the cross section minus the thickness thickness of the web divided by 4 approximately we are going to get of the outstand so of the outstand is the portion where we need to determine the thickness of the flange so this is uh, what is referred to as the horizontal axis in steel table it is uh, designated as xx but in case of is for is 500 sorry is uh, 800 it is represented as zz so the vertical axis uh, is yy in both is code as well as in steel table so we need to identify the importance of these factors and accordingly the values are to be listed and used appropriately in the analysis and design now kindly say how the i section is uh, used in a building where we have i section used as a beam where connected by sets of bolts and also we have the vertical element which is used as a column so column and beam section where i sections are being used and how this uh, i section is designated from the point of identifying its properties uh, from the steel table it goes like this ismb 300 an example at the rate 460 newton per meter what is the meaning of this here 300 represents the overall depth of the section in steel table the overall depth is designated as capital d otherwise from steel table otherwise from is 800 it is represented as small h and what is the number 460 it is a weight in newton per meter 
in some steel table the weight is given as kg per meter but in some steel table it is available in terms of newton per meter so we have to be careful while selecting the weight also whether it is newton per meter or kg per meter what is the meaning of this and if you have one meter length of ESMB you must have seen this beam a beam having a depth of 300 so you can imagine what is this 300 it is uh, close to the length of uh, a metal scale 30 centimeter metal scale and that is what the depth and if you take one meter length so probably with difficulty so one person can lift uh, that one meter length of the beam what is the weight of that beam it is 46 kg so 46 kg with difficulty you can lift it so that is what the importance of one meter length of ISMB 600 Suppose if you have ISMB 600, 600 being the maximum depth as far as ISMB is concerned and we also need to see what is the minimum depth and what is the maximum depth in that particular category of ISMB or even ISHB. In some cases depth up to 600 is available but in some cases as we have in case of ISHB meant for column, we will not be having uh, the depth up to 600. So these are all some of the things that we need to identify and appreciate from steel table. Now I have taken the different properties of uh, the I sections and for that there is a separate code available IS808. In fact we have these properties available separately in steel table and also in our IS800 in one particular page uh, as an appendix uh, we find uh, the properties of I section where even the plastic section modulus of the cross section also will be able to get it. But in many of the steel table plastic section modulus uh, is not available. So in such situation we can refer to one special publication SP61. So that is where uh, the properties of different types of cross section will be able to get it. And I will uh, introduce to all these things uh, in the next class where I will show the importances of many of these course of practices. Now as you can see here I have listed the properties of ISMB as a function of the depth. ISMB 100, 125, 150, 175, 200 and after that it is increasing at the rate of 50, 250, 300, 350 and like that the maximum depth goes up to 600, ISMB 600. As the section increases in terms of the number designation, the depth also increases because the number in the designation represents the overall depth. The weight of the beam per meter also increases. As you can see here, so this is a small beam having a depth of 10 cm. You know what that 10 cm is, you kindly imagine yourself and 1 meter length of that beam is about 11.5 kg so definitely it can be lifted with one hand and if you have ISMB 300 as I mentioned it weighs 46 kg and probably with two hands will be able to lift the beam. ISMB 600 you may not be able to lift on your own. What happens to the cross sectional area? The cross sectional area also increases as the depth increases so that is what you can see so depending on the cross section so we will be able to identify an appropriate cross section for resisting the tension or the compression. So in the design of tension member and compression member, so this property cross section area plays a very important role. And you can also make out what is the width of the cross section as the depth increases the width also increases proportionately and the thickness of the web and thickness of flange even that also increases as the depth of the beam increases. The moment of inertia with respect to the horizontal axis, kindly see the unit. So this is a very very important thing. In uh, some steel table this is uh, given in terms of centimeter but in some steel table it is given in terms of ml. But if you see IS 800 all these values are available in terms of mm to the power centimeter, mm to the power 4. So whatever is the reference you are making, kindly see the notation and accordingly write these values and when you are using in analysis and design you should be careful to see what dimension of that parameter you are putting and accordingly you are getting the answer.
Now these are all uh, the cross sections of the uh, different uh, elements. So we have seen the I section. Now it is uh, the channel section. In fact, the channel section, if you see, it is uh, half of the I section, where I section is split in the vertical direction. If you split the I section in the horizontal direction, you are going to get the T section. And what channel section you have here, if you split it horizontally, what one portion you are going to get. So that is what uh, the cross section that looks in the form of an angle. And individual element of an angle is looking in the form of a flat or a small piece of plate. And of course, you also have a tube where internally it is hollow. And sometimes it can be solid also. Solid tube and a hollow tube comes into picture. And how all these things can be designated. So this is where the importance of designation comes into picture. So we have different types of channel sections like uh, the classification of I sections. We have ISGC, Indian Standard Junior Channel, Indian Standard Lightweight Channel, Indian Standard Medium Weight Channel, Indian Standard Heavy Channel. So the designation is similar to the designation of an I section. ISMC 300 at the rate, some weight in the form of Newton per meter or kg per meter depending on the situation, where 300 is the depth of the channel section represented as small h. Now, as far as the angle section is concerned, it can be an equal angle where uh, both the legs are having the same uh, length. Uh, otherwise, uh, it can be an unequal angle also where the legs are of uh, different uh, lengths. So, it is designated as ISA, Indian Standard Angle. ISA 50 by 50 by 5 means it is an equal angle where the length of the angle from the outside and the length of the angle of the other element that is the depth of the angle, so they are same, where the thickness of the entire angle is same and it is uniform. Now kindly appreciate here also it is a tapered flange as far as uh, channel is concerned and also kindly see the fillet here, a transitional change in the thickness. So uh, very similar to that uh, we have the angle section where we have the root of the fillet where some concentration of the extra material comes into picture. A transitional change in the curvature also plays an important role. So that the stress concentration when elements from different directions are meeting, so that can be avoided. And also see how transitionally the thickness is uh, changed at the tip. So these are all some of the important uh, factors uh, that controls the residual stress or the concentration of the stress uh, in the cross section, which we will be discussing uh, later. Now, as far as the T section is concerned, so it is 50% uh, of the I section, but 50% means where the section is cut horizontally. And in fact, we have two elements. One is the horizontal element referred to as the flange. And of course, uh, it is the stem. It is the vertical element. So the designation is uh, Indian Standard Junior T, Indian Standard Normal T. Indian Standard Normal T having a depth of 250. What is the depth? It is the depth of the cross section that is very important and we have to see what is the width of the section, thickness of the flange and the thickness of the web. All these things we will be able to get it from the steel table. So that is where the designation comes into picture. So this is an Indian standard flat. This is to be designated by its cross section. Indian standard flat example 200 by 10 means it is having a width of 200 mm 20 centimeter and whose thickness is 10 mm 1 centimeter. So this is an Indian standard tube having some diameter say 200 with a thickness of say 10 mm. So all these cross sections can be used uh, in the construction of uh, uh, steel structures. In fact we have seen different uh, configurations of the steel structures, different types of trusses, different types of frames and in one way or the other all these sections are being used. Especially in case of roof trusses, in case of transmission towers you must have seen outside. So different elements are being used, I sections, channel sections and angle sections. Mostly angles plays a important role. In any of the industrial building 
more than 50% of the cross section goes in the form of a an angle and you can see some of the applications of channels being listed here so and these channel sections can be used in varieties of uh, steel cylinder construction in appliances also you can uh, use these channels in many of the structures meant for transportation used in uh, making signposts so this is uh, what you normally see along the road where signposts indicating uh, certain cautions you will be able to see used in wood flooring for athletic uh, purposes used in installing and making uh, windows and doors so these angle sections plays a very important role and as we have in case of i section so these angle sections also have some deficiency in channel section also the moment of inertia in the horizontal axis is substantially more compared to the moment of inertia in the vertical direction so this is good with respect to uh, unidirectional moment and it is not so good with respect to bidirectional moment or even with respect to torsion and if you see the applications of angles so you can see how these angles are uh, kept in a uh, shop so it can be used in uh, uh, framings of different types it can also be used as a reinforcement it can be used as brackets used in transmission towers roof trusses bridges lifting and transporting machinery uh, reactors vessels warehouses industrial boilers structural steel angles are used in rolling shutters for fabricating guides for strength and durability and many of these uh, applications uh, you must have seen in one way or the other outside uh, where some fabrication works are going on and i have listed a few applications of the flats and whatever the examples uh, have mentioned uh, previously in all those applications so these flats can be used uh, in one way or the other and especially to form connections between the members the flats are being used so it has an application in railway ports in ordnance factories hand tools engineering industries auto components and of course in domestic quite good products office furniture and of course there are many other appliances and small applications where flats can be used and again uh, these are all uh, the typical uh, cross sections uh, we will be using in the form of a beam where beam is a flexural member and you can use a single solid rod as a flexural member in a very small application or a small span where it is subjected to uh, very low loading and we can also use the individual cross sections in the form of channels and i sections and sometimes you can strengthen the i section strengthen the channel section by putting two or more sections in some configuration so that is where the compound sections or built up section comes into picture so you can see here it is a sort of a box section made out of plates here a combination of i section and the channel section is being used where the strength of the compression flange is enhanced by putting this uh, channel element so these are all the cross sections uh, plays an important role uh, in gantry girder analysis and design so these are all uh, some of the other cross sections that goes inside the concrete so they are called as uh, the encased beam or the composite beam in case of composite beam the performance of steel as a i section and the performance of concrete is being explored so you can also cut the cross sections in different configurations along the length and you will be able to get uh, the tapered section a section having a small depth in one side and a substantially larger depth at the other end you can also cut the i section in specific pattern along the web and you can lift one portion and just push it offset it by one trough length so we are going to get a configuration which looks something like this so with this uh, the depth of the final section will be 25% to 100% more compared to the depth of the original cross section so in that sense the resistance of the beam horizontally can be increased by many folds the moment of inertia of the cross section increases substantially so these type of sections are called as castellated sections of the open sections where 
will be introducing a series of opening along the web. In fact, the resistance to the shear is generally provided by the web. So much depth and so much area of the web is really not required and that is the reason we will be introducing series of openings and thereby the moment of inertia is enhanced with respect to the horizontal axis by keeping the two flanges substantially away from each other. Now this is uh, another uh, diagram where we will be able to see the different types of uh, individual suctions and combinations of suctions that can be used as a tension member and also as a compression member. The first few sections are the, the individual sections. So this is a single angle but here it is a double angle where angles can be kept back to back depending on the situation where it is to be connected either by bolting or by welding. And if you see these sections, so these are all the sections where we will be using two or more independent sections and thereby you are forming a new section, formed section, compound section or a fabricated section and still many other combinations of the fabricated section we will be able to get by building different sections uh, appropriately so that the required moment of inertia with respect to horizontal axis and also with respect to the vertical axis can be obtained. So this is one example where uh, beam is connected to a collar. So this is referred to as uh, beam to beam column connection. I will be introducing now to the concept of what is a flexible connection. More about this you will be able to see in the subsequent uh, uh, classes. Now what is important here is a horizontal beam element is connected to a vertical column. For ensuring the connection we will be using one angle at the top and one angle at the bottom and these are connected by one or two bolts. So if you make a connection something like this and if you see the behavior of uh, the beam with respect to the column when the beam is loaded so you will be seeing a substantial slope at this uh, support. So this behaves something like a simply supported beam. As you know in case of a simply supported beam so there exists a slope at the support. The curvature changes gradually from one end to the other end and if you connect these two members by welding or maybe by putting a strong connections and angles and suitable number of bolts, then the connection will become somewhat rigid. So this is where the importance of flexible connection comes into picture and this is another flexible connection where the beam is connected to the collar by means of angles provided in the web. But if you see here, the connection at the top and bottom is by means of an angle where flanges are connected to the column. But here the web is connected to the column. Here also the beam is connected to the column by connecting the web of the beam to the flanges of the column. Whatever is the type of the connection here, there exists a slope between the two members. So thereby these connections acts as a flexible connections or just the simple connections. Now I will be introducing to the rigid connections. So if you really want to have the rigid connection, we need to have too many bolts to be provided. The number of bolts uh, is uh, more compared to the number of bolts provided in the previous connection which is the flexible connection. And if you connect uh, the beam and the column with the help of a weld, obviously the connection will become rigid. The slope between uh, the two members will be zero. So that is where the importance of uh, rigid connection compared to the flexible connection comes into picture. So we will see more about uh, these types of connections in the subsequent classes and the importances of the connections. It is just an introduction as a part of the second class. Now these are all uh, some of the photographs which we will be able to uh, 
uh, C outside also where different uh, cross sections of the steel are being used and we have the sheets also used as a covering material and this only indicates uh, how the different uh, types of steel buildings and steel frames can be fabricated using many of the sections uh, which I discussed just now. And some of the applications, so this is uh, an industrial shed, so again uh, eye sections and uh, channel sections and of course angle sections can be used and for connecting either bolting or welding can be adopted. So another important uh, thing uh, we should know is uh, about uh, the different manufacturers uh, in India who produces steel. In fact, we have uh, one uh, popular uh, steel manufacturing company, SAIL, Steel Authority of India Limited, and uh, we have RSP, Rurkala Steel Plant in Orissa. We also have Bakaro Steel Limited in Charkhand. So we have Durgapur Steel Plant in West Bengal. So Bilai Steel Plant in Chhattisgarh. We also have Rastriya Spatnikam Limited, Ishakapatanam Steel Plant, producing different types of steel sections. Tata Steel is uh, another uh, example. Tisco Steel, you are all quite familiar. So it is uh, manufactured from Jamshedpur and also that is in Jharkhand. So we also have Jindal Vijayanagar Steel Plant, Thorangal in Ballari in Karnataka. So where different uh, steel sections are being manufactured. So let us see what are the advantages and uh, disadvantages of uh, steel. Now as far as the advantages are concerned, so the material is uh, having a very high strength. So that is the one of the important advantage compared to either concrete or any other construction material. So the cross section is uh, very compact in many of the cases and as a result of that uh, the steel is uh, light in weight. So the combination of strength and weight where high strength to weight ratio plays a very important role but on the other hand in case of concrete the ratio of strength to weight if you see it is not that good. So there is a reason in case of steel structure high strength to weight ratio plays a very important role. Uniformity in cross section, uniformity in properties throughout the length of the member is another uh, advantages. It is rather easy to use and there are many other desirable properties that makes steel a material of choice for numerous uh, structures such as steel bridges, high rise buildings, towers and other structures. So you can see some of the photographs where different uh, cross sections of the steel are uh, being uh, used and this is uh, a framed structure where eye sections are used different uh, depth of eye sections. So a few more uh, examples just to appreciate uh, the importance of steel as a structural element. So this is the bridge. So this is really fascinating to see. So again huge eye sections are being used here. And this is what I showed uh, in the previous class also. So another uh, configuration of the bridge. And of course, these are the silos and uh, transmission line tower. And as I told in transmission line towers, the entire transmission line tower can be fabricated only using angles. And of course, uh, at the connection, you need some plates in the form of brackets. Nothing other than angle is needed here. Now let us see some of the properties of uh, steel that is uh, important to understand the behavior of the material. So the first one is uh, the concept of elasticity as I mentioned. The steel is uh, an elastic material. In fact, it is a linearly elastic material. And that if you see in the initial stage, the stress is directly proportional to strength. And it is one of the important uh, advantage that till the proportionality limit, the concept of stress proportional to strength can be used. In that sense, uh, the design of section by working stress method is a very simple thing. Ductility, as I mentioned, it is uh, the deformation capability of the material. 
what is the amount of uh, extension or uh, the amount of contraction the material undergoes when a uniaxial tension or compression is applied. So the ductility is the energy absorption capacity in uniaxial direction. The toughness is uh, in a way similar to ductility but it is the energy absorption capacity over the entire volume of the material comes into picture. The toughness is uh, the resistance of the material to strength and also to the deformation. So that is where both strength and ductility are considered in defining the toughness. Another important uh, property for any material for that matter is the durability. So the steel should be durable so that you can expect maximum from steel as a material and that is possible only when you maintain the steel properly. Otherwise we have the problem of corrosion and controlling corrosion in steel is very difficult. And we also have a few more uh, advantages of steel. So additions and alterations uh, to the existing structure can be done very easily. For example, new bay or even the entire new wings uh, can be added to the existing frame building and steel bridges may easily be widened. So you really, you really need not have to demolish the structure. The existing structure can be used and some alterations can be done to suit the new requirement or the specific requirement and sometimes some additions can also be done taking the existing structure into consideration. Transportation, fabrication, erection and dismantling is uh, rather easy and it is quick and of course less labor is uh, needed. So this is uh, one important uh, aspect at the time of construction. So compared to RCC, so this is uh, very very advantageous uh, when it comes to the question of steel as a structural material. Another thing is uh, the material has a high scrap value. So even after using the steel structure almost for about 50, 60, 70 years and even if you dismantle it, it's not that the material becomes waste, so that can be sold to a reasonable rate and that is where you get some returns as a scrap value. And that scrap value is rather less in case of RCC. Unless you break RCC, so it is not possible to convert the demolition waste either into aggregate or for any other use. So there is a processing charge involved in the demolition and in the conversion of the concrete as a recycled aggregate. Whereas in case of steel, so directly it can be sold to the manufacturer and that can be used as a material for manufacturing uh, the new steel. So steel as you know it is not susceptible to creep, shrinkage and swelling. It does not exist and this is the property of concrete and of course uh, even in timber also we have this uh, problem of shrinkage and swelling. Creep as you know it is uh, the time dependent deformation the material undergoes due to the sustained action of the loom. And this you see in case of concrete. In case of steel, so there is no change in the behavior when the load is kept on the member over a time. So the concept of creep doesn't come into picture. So we also have a few disadvantages as far as steel is concerned. I told you the steel is having individual members in the form of flanges and web. And since these flanges and web, so they are slender in nature. Individually as a member, it is an element. The width of the element compared to the thickness is very large. As a result of that, the flange and web undergo buckling when there is a compressive load comes into picture. So you can see here in the photograph, I have shown near the junction, both the flange and the web have undergone local buckling. It is the yielding of the material at certain localized places where concentration of the load and the stress comes into picture. And similarly you can see here near the junction, so there is a localized failure of the web. That is what is called as the buckling of the web. And some sort of a buckling wave also you will be able to see if you watch it carefully a certain length of the web. A similar type of deformation where the flange is going out towards the to the outside is also being uh, seen here 
and uh, these are all uh, the problems connected with uh, steel sections and that is what is referred to as uh, the local failure maybe local failure mainly because of buckling effect and this local failure due to buckling in the cross section is not seen in RCC cross section where the entire cross section is solid. Now these are all uh, the four important uh, disadvantages in addition to local buckling. The maintenance cost of steel uh, is uh, really more and we need to spend and constant and continuous maintenance uh, is one of the important thing in order to avoid the corrosion. Fire proofing cost uh, is also rather high. Steel is a incombustible material. But however, its strength is reduced tremendously at high temperature due to common fire. So when there is a fire hazard, the temperature increases beyond 500 to 800 degree centigrade. And in that temperature, the yield stress of the material decreases substantially. An increase in temperature up to 100 to 200 degree centigrade definitely causes substantial deformation, elongation, but the yield stress may not decrease considerably but when the temperature increases beyond 500 degree centigrade and goes up to 1000 and even more than that the yield stress of the material decreases and sometimes uh, it will be as low as 10 to 15 percent of the yield stress and another important point to be addressed uh, is the fatigue the strength of the structural steel member can be reduced if this member is uh, subjected to cyclic loading it is a sort of repetitive loading uh, over a time the structure is subjected. So one example is uh, the towers, the uh, any bridges. So where there is a continuous uh, rolling load coming into picture. So every day the structural element is subjected to series of uh, cyclic loading. Reversal of stress comes into picture and this is uh, uh, what the uh, effect uh, called as the fatigue on the structural element. The structure is also sometimes uh, undergo brittle fracture, the brittle failure. The material as you know basically it is a ductile material but the ductile material instead of undergoing failure by continuous deformation it may fail in the form of a uh, what I can say cast iron or a brittle material. So the ductile behavior is not being seen but it fails by fracture which is the property of the brittle material. So that can happen, so when the structural element is subjected to very low temperature or there are many instances where such type of brittle fracture can take place especially when it is subjected to reversal cycle of loading. So this are also the disadvantages of steel as a structural material. So you can see some of the photographs where uh, the structural element has undergone corrosion. So the corrosion is uh, beyond uh, the limit. It is extremely difficult to repair such type of uh, sections. You have to spend uh, heavily in order to bring it back to the original position. The question of bringing back to the original position is really not possible here because the entire uh, uh, roofing sheet is being eaten away. So there is no other go except to replace the element. So this is a serious issue as far as steel is concerned and that is the reason continuous maintenance plays a important role. So I will stop at this particular stage and I will be continuing uh, with uh, types of load and uh, combinations of the load in the next class. Thank you very much. If you have any questions you can ask.